everybody. I have a phone here to auction. Uh, <laughs> if anybody would like, here we go. Um, what could I get off of this? Uh, here we go. Thanks, folks. Um, guys, thanks so much for joining us. I, Rip, I, I started out reading uh, bo uh, both about you, but I, I love this story written in the Baltimore Sun about 18 years ago. Uh, and it's a story of him standing out in a kind of by the croquet nets or the, you know, and, and having some home-brewed beer. Uh, which they made before the genome was sequenced, and uh, uh, you basically had this massive shock because you had submitted yourself two weeks before uh, to be bitten on the arm as, as mosquitoes filled their bellies with your blood. Uh, I'm quoting the paper in that. Um, and you, you, your, your first effort at that time at a malaria vaccine didn't work because you got, you got ill. And I'm interested just to start out, given what science has done and given that the World Health Organization on Monday announced a major, major uh, um, possibility of the deployment of a huge new malaria vaccine, how, has time, how have times changed since you were a human guinea pig for this? And is there anything else you'd be a human guinea pig for today? Uh, <laughs> but but how, how has what we're talking about today changed that game? Well, you know, this I've been involved in malaria vaccine development for about 30 years. And it's really taken us 30 years to get to the point where we actually have uh, the potential to introduce a, a vaccine in sub-Saharan Africa. At the time that we began this, we, it, the tools that were required to this clearly required the beginnings of the genomic era. So we had molecular biology tools. The, the fact that we were able to make that vaccine was because someone was able to sequence the, the full uh, uh, a complete gene from a parasite, the first time it had ever been done, uh, folks at the NIH. And that really directly led to the discovery and the ability to make a vaccine that was eventually uh, successful. Now, I was just yet at, a, at a conference at Johns Hopkins yesterday where we were reflecting on what we have learned from that phase three study where we actually took every parasite that came from every child that was infected, 16,000 children participated mm. in this. and sequenced the parasite genome for every one of those parasites. And the, th this is, gives you the real ability now to drill down and understand how is the vaccine working, how can we make it better, uh, and this, will, this is clearly going to lead to advances to improvements uh, against malaria. You know, Mark, you, one of the, so we were talking off stage, and, and some folks were telling us that the vaccine arena is one of those that many people look as the sleepy part of the drug business. Uh, you were at Merck for many years. Now you had the International um, uh, AIDS Vaccine Initiative, uh, which, by the way, if you guys haven't looked at their, their website and, and YouTube video, it's, it's stunning because I was looking at the fact that 420,000 people died last year from mal malaria. What, 40 million people have died of AIDS, 1.2 million last year. And so it's staggering, you know, the kind of, we're talking about consequential things. But, but before you get to the AIDS stuff, you, you guys were competitors. I don't know if we could make an HBO show out of it, but you were at Merck, you were at GSK. You both worked on malaria vaccine. You both worked on Ebola vaccine. You, 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 you've been at each other's, uh, you know, kind of clip. So do you, do you love each other or is it a deep rivalry? No, I think we both share a common commitment. I mean, we believe in the power of vaccines and we believe in the power of science to improve the human condition. And I think both Rip and I also, you know, strongly believe in the ability of, you know, partnerships to address problems of, um, you know, low-income countries where these right. diseases have their greatest impact and where the typical market forces would not drive investment to enable products, whether it's drugs or vaccines, to be available. So you just said typical market forces wouldn't drive you there. Does that need to be fixed in some way? Is that a market failure more broadly as you look at something like Ebola? No, it's, it's, well, I mean, it's a market failure. I mean, there is a commercial aspect to it, but there's also a failure of imagination about how you can make it possible for different stakeholders. I mean, so academics are great at certain things. You know, NGOs are great at certain things. Pharmaceutical companies are great at certain things. Mm -hmm. But you're only going to get a solution to these complicated problems that, you know, there's an economic issue, there's a scientific challenge, there's a uncertainty challenge that no one sector can really take on by itself, and it's only by finding new ways for the different sectors to work together, so. But to go back to the science for a minute, and to Ebola, for instance, yeah. because I know you both worked on, on, on uh, trying to, to reach very rapidly in 10 months uh, an Ebola vaccine, and you succeeded. 
and today you can, it's not out there licensed and easily gettable. So, so is that a failure of government? Is that a failure of the policy apparatus? And what did, I mean, what did science allow you to do in that case? Well, I mean, you know, science and genomics make it possible for, you know, contemporary vaccinology, vaccine development approaches to take place. We would be nowhere. I mean, earlier vaccines were developed by empiric methods. You had an idea you, like, would grow a virus in tissue culture to try to attenuate it or you would kill it and, and you would inject someone and see what happened, you know, that would be an empiric approach. Now, mm -hmm. it's much more predicated on very high resolution science. And is that what they call reverse vaccinology? Well, reverse vaccinology is one element of mm -hmm. it where you understand the genome of the pathogen and try to identify potential targets and then elicit immune responses against that. But it's actually much broader now. So work we at IAVI are doing and our partners are doing is really understanding in detail the human immune response to HIV infection, understanding which people make what seem to be protective immune responses, and then use high-resolution structural biology, which is totally enabled by genomics, to really make vaccine candidates that are different and specifically designed to elicit the protective immune responses, which normally don't occur very frequently in mm. infected people. So we would be nowhere without science, but we wouldn't be anywhere without, you know, multiple partners working together to make this happen because the work that made this high resolution science possible started out in, you know, in villages in Africa where individuals are at high risk of infection and you understand those people, you understand the dynamics of the infection, you understand how the virus is transmitted, how it evolves, how their immune system responds to it, and, and those individuals allowed us and our collaborators to identify protective immune responses that are now guiding vaccine development. So it is this connection between you know, field research, which Rip is very familiar with, to the laboratory, which he's also very familiar with. And those connections don't happen by accident. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of positive precedents. And the Ebola response was one tremendous one where groups of stakeholders came together many of whom had never worked together before. Many and you of, both worked together on that? Well, we worked in parallel programs, but we were both doing everything we could to develop a vaccine as quickly as possible. There had never been an Ebola outbreak as bad as the one in 2014 to 2016, and people thought that it might actually end up getting much worse than it actually did. So there was a real rush to do something that had really not been done before is develop a vaccine in time to bring an epidemic to an end in, mm -hmm. in that same epidemic rather than preparing for future ones. So it was a unprecedented response. And as you said, you know, things have slowed down because it's fallen from the headlines and there is a relationship, as you at the Atlantic know, between public awareness, you know, media coverage and, and action, and that happens in science too. But, you know, it's, it's not all negative. This, you, you mentioned reverse vaccinology, and it's not just pie in the sky. I mean, this tool, which... Could you, could you so for the folks reverse, watching reverse, online, sort of sure. take us down that path? For reverse vaccinology, we are talking about taking the sequence of a uh, in this case, a bacteria, the bacteria that causes meningococcus B meningitis, uh, a very complex organism for which many uh, academic scientists and companies had worked for decades to try to produce a vaccine unsuccessfully. But uh, about two decades ago, really with the beginning of the genomics revolution, working with Craig Ventner, uh, Reno Rapioli from the GSK worked with him to sequence the entire genome of this bacteria and then use that information to select from a hundreds of potential proteins that could be used to make a vaccine to find those few that were really going to make a difference. This allowed the creation of a vaccine which is now saving the lives of millions of children. It's, it is a real delivery on genomics. What would you say, and you know, I'm being in the pipeline in, in GSK, and I know you're no longer at Merck, but, but what would you say are some of the things that we might see in the pipeline that would be surprising to, to us? I mean, I, if, we, if we go back to the learnings that we've had from this Ebola 
uh, outbreak. One of the things that has been very clear is that we need to be able to respond very quickly. What, what really keeps me up at night in terms mm. of future threats is the one that we don't know about. Mm. Uh, and it's out there somewhere or will be out there as, it, as evolution moves these viruses, they're usually viruses along. Mm. Uh, and so our ability to respond quickly uh, and to be able to produce a, a vaccine in this case quickly really relies on this technology and the ability to, 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 uh, to sequence uh, a virus very quickly to take that information and actually put it into what we refer to as platform technologies that allow the rapid production and scale up of a new vaccine. And we're, we're working with one that we re refer to as SAM self amplifying messenger RNA. Messenger RNA as a way of delivering new vaccines is an incredibly exciting new area. It's completely synthetic. It allows the, the ability to scale up massively, quickly, and using very standardized processes, which will shorten the time and reduce the cost of development of vaccines. This is it's new technology. Uh, it's something that we're actively working on and I think really holds uh, big potential for responding not only to epidemic diseases where we don't know uh, uh, the target yet, but for other diseases where uh, it's been very, very difficult to, uh, to develop vaccines because of the complexity of doing it. You know, we've had a lot of coverage since the Trump administration has come in on alliances, on strategic alliances, how to deal with Russia, how will, will Germany and the United States, the UK be on the same page, or how to deal with North Korea. And it's made me think about what is the state of our health care alliances out there? because they don't get as much attention. When you have uh, uh, breakouts in Hong Kong or China or Southeast Asia or Africa or Latin America, Zika, um, what, what do we need to do it that we're not doing right now to have the same sorts of strategic alliances on the global healthcare front? I, mean, I, I think one of the good things is that we've had, and we, saw, we all saw this in the Ebola, tremendous goodwill. Mm -hmm. People stepped up to the plate, companies stepped up, regulators stepped up, the, the global health agencies, but it wasn't very coordinated. Mm. And it, it had the feeling like, well, okay, we're going to deal with this now, but it's a one-off. And, and I, I think, you know, Mark, is, you've lived through this. Um, what do we do next? I mean, how, what would you how do, do different, Mark? Well, could, before I get to that, mm. I'd like to address a different aspect of your question. Sure. So you're talking about alliances in, in science, and when you think about alliances in science, um, the world's uh, protection against emerging infectious disease threats and existing infectious disease threats like HIV depends on the response of the United States government. The mm -hmm. Ebola response would not have gotten anywhere near as far along, and we would not have been able to achieve the success we did without the support from the US government and the partnership of key US government institutions, including the NIH and the CDC. As we think about you know, protection against you know, important diseases like AIDS, you know, the PEPFAR program has transformed global access to HIV treatment, and Claire Pomeroy referred to this in the first session, and you know, programs at USAID, the US Agency for International Development, both support a lot of HIV work. Um, as well as, you know, really work in the emerging infectious disease threats to, like, let us know what is the next over the horizons to screen animals using so-called metagenomic approaches mm -hmm. to understand which viruses are out there that we don't know about so we could be prepared for them, and importantly, the investments in the NIH. And, you know, in current discussions in Washington, all of those programs are under threat. And if all of those programs are under threat, the United States government's leadership is going to be markedly diminished, our long-term credibility will be lost, and importantly, a lot of the progress that we've made in global public health will be reversed, and that is like really tragic and horrifying to think That's about. That's your up at night issue. That's, yes, if you ask me what worries me the most, we are on this verge of, like you've heard it in every speaker today, the, you know, this transformation in, in medicine and in public health and if we back off on you know, investment in science, if we back off on our investment in you know, global health, then um, much of that progress, it will be a missed opportunity that people will regret for a very long time. The first line in the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative video I watched a little while ago, like says, what if, you know, what if your children just saw AIDS as something in the history books? 
What do you see as either the political or technological barriers to actually make that happen? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's been, and you know, Claire alluded to this in her comments, there's been tremendous progress. So the IAVI was founded in 1996. The discussions that led up to it took place at a time when there were no effective treatments for HIV. Now there are. Mm -hmm. um, there was no imagination that you could get those therapies to people living in low-income countries and that they would allow people to live healthy, normal lifespans, which was inconceivable at the time. And you know, clearly there's a need it was recognized at that time for a vaccine to end the epidemic. And clearly, we now have additional modalities, you know, treatment, so-called pre-exposure prophylaxis, where you give antiretroviral drugs to people who aren't infected to protect them from getting infected. But you know, we're going to need a vaccine to end this epidemic. That's very clear. The major challenge there, I mean, is really a scientific one. We've never made a vaccine against a pathogen like HIV. And the only way we're going to get there is by state-of-the-art science, and in that regard, genomics is a key element to that. There would be mm. no path forward without insights from the genomic revolution. So what's happening now is something that's never been done in vaccinology before. It's really sort of taking all of those basic insights about the virus, about the host, and using that to design a specific kind of vaccine to elicit a specific type of immune response, which we think will be protective. If we're able to do that, that would not only be the path to an effective AIDS vaccine in the end of AIDS, it would be um, revolutionary more broadly for uh, vaccines for can, other can infectious you personal, diseases. Can I ask you a slightly personal question? You're, you're now an NGO leader, major global national NGO leader, and you used to be in the private sector side of, of research and development on, on these issues. Do you look at someone like Rip and GSK, not him personally because he's a decent, cool guy, but, but that, that industry cool. is someone <laughs> I know you need to partner with, but, but what are the points of tension between what you need to have done and how companies in this field are operating? Yeah, well, that's a great and important question. So, I mean, you have part of my CV. So, I, yes, I work as the head of a not-for-profit product development partnership now. I used to work at a pharmaceutical company before that. I worked in academia, and I've spent time working for the U.S. federal yeah, government. We all, so have, seen, we all have trouble keeping a job. Yeah, yeah. I know. I mean, <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't bring that up. <laughs> no, but I've seen this issue from multiple perspectives. Right. And for me, there's so many missed opportunities for collaboration mm. between different sectors. And I think the heart of the problem is that different sectors don't understand both the possibilities and the commitment of people and the limitations on them. So, you know, yeah. there was a commentary earlier by a pharmaceutical representative talking about how much people in pharma companies care about doing things mm. to improve health outcomes and, and doing the right thing for individuals and, and the public. I totally agree with that. And, you know, that's true for academics, that's true for government people as well. So they all have that common view. So it just comes down to an understanding of like what gets in the way of something like a pharmaceutical company mm -hmm. being able to contribute. You know, they can't just drop everything and focus on an emerging infectious disease. That's basically what happened with Ebola. And I think that was really a profound reflection of mm. the commitment of pharmaceutical companies to do the right thing. But it also highlighted that the current system doesn't work. They can't be asked to do that again and again. And we need new models of partnerships. Rip, can I ask you the same thing, but from, from the other side that, I mean, you, you put yourself, your body on the line, literally, on, on trying to find a malaria vaccine. It's very uh, commendable and scary to someone like me. But, it's, uh, but thanks for doing all that. Um, when, you, when you look at the NGO community that's out there trying to get some of this stuff right, what do you think they need to know better than they do about some of the drivers of your industry and R&D? And again, just in full disclosure, in that 30 years, the first 15 years, I was a government scientist mm. working, at in, the Reed, U right? working yeah. in the U.S. Army. Yeah. I went to industry, and in that, during that 15 years in industry, I also spent two years at the Gates Foundation. Mm. So I have seen, like, like Mark, I have seen this from different perspectives. And I think, in, particularly in the area of vaccines, the, what is not easy for people who are not doing, who actually in the ground working on vaccines, is to understand the time scale associated with it. Uh, the, the what? I, the time scale. Mm -hmm. the, the, the time that's required to go from the initial discovery to the licensure of a vaccine 
in the best of conditions, is still a decade. Now, we may be able to do better in the future, but it takes, it takes vision. It takes uh, the ability to be in should there it, for the long haul. Should it take 10 years when we can now sequence the genome and, and the things you've said? Do the methodologies that we used to have fit a different world? Do, you, do they need to be rethought so for how fast things can the, happen? Just to, to, to show you how quickly things have changed, we can take from de novo gen genomic information to a actual product in a vial using this, this uh, new platform I referred to, SAM, in a period of about three weeks. And you actually have something in the vial that you So that three-week thing still is a 10-year process. Why? Because to, to turn that into a product that is licensed, that is available, still requires the full process of clinical development and all of the, um, and, it's a, and it's very much driven by a regulatory system that is there to ensure that vaccines and drugs are safe and effective. It's very important. That process has not kept pace with the technology that mm -hmm. allows us to bring new potential products to the point where we can begin to have the testing. I think at, when you're trying to develop a vaccine against a, a prophylactic vaccine, you are trying to protect people from a relatively rare event. You still need to do large trials in order to be able to, d to demonstrate that the vaccine has efficacy and you need large numbers to confirm safety. So those are things which are gonna be very difficult to compress. I'm not saying that, it's, that new technology can't help us do it, but it, it, is, it is still a long road. And what I have found working with partners is that it's hard to sustain the energy and the commitment over that long period of time. People change, mm. interests change, priorities change, and this is a, this is a long-term investment. What would life be like if Venter hadn't succeeded? I was just listening to Karen Nelson up here a minute ago. It sort of blew me away. What if that had not happened? What would we be dealing with? Well, Mark and I probably would be doing different roles here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we would be, in terms of vaccines, you know, there, there's a wonderful history of vaccine development <laughs> that goes back, you know, hundreds of years, literally, and it's really remarkable that what people accomplished with sort of kind of minimal scientific insights. But I think those empiric approaches kind of came to the end of the road and really for developing vaccines against the infectious agents that we currently don't have vaccines for or thinking about how to use vaccines for say cancer immunotherapy or treatment of other diseases, um, we wouldn't have a path forward without mm. the genetic uh, revolution. That, that seems pretty clear to me. Just before I go to all the audience, I want to ask a question. I'm just reading as well in this week. It's WHO, World Immunization Week. Um, there have been a lot of announcements this week, including the malaria uh, vaccine uh, trials for Africa. But there's also this rotavirus, uh, rotavirus, if I'm pronouncing correctly, mm -hmm. vaccine that's been developed by an Indian company and the Doctors Without Borders have, have helped do it with phenomenal success. And this is another uh, a virus that's had a huge, huge uh, mm -hmm. uh, mortality rate in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by the fact that an Indian company developed this and that the, what they've done is, 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 according to reports, very, very inexpensive. What, it was, what, what are we missing um, in our discussion today about the richness of what's going on outside of the United States in terms of, of drug activity and vaccine activity? Yeah, so just with respect to that story, so the first rotavirus vaccines were uh, developed by Merck and GSK, mm -hmm. and they were licensed around 2006 in the United States, so it's now over 10 years after that. To Riff's point, this research that um, went into that vaccine, I know Merck started working on that vaccine in 1991 wow. to get it licensed by right. 2006, and a major issue there was verifying the safety of the so vaccines, 15 years. which, yeah, 15 yeah. years, which Rip <laughs> talked about, you know, having a pathway demonstrating that it was possible to make a rotavirus vaccine and that it was uh, both efficacious and safe made it possible to think about other partnership models mm. to increase global access to that vaccine. And while both Merck and GSK worked hard to enable global access, there is room for additional um, vaccine production and there's a desire to have the vaccines be produced 
as affordably as possible, mm -hmm. which is something that you know specific companies in India, like the one that did this, Serum Institute of India, have tremendous experience making high quality, low cost vaccines. And there's increasing partnership between the multinational pharmaceutical companies and so-called developing country manufacturers to really figure out how do you not only get vaccines to the wealthier countries, but mm -hmm. how do you make them widely available in low income countries as quickly as possible? Mm -hmm. And there too, it's like no one entity can do it on its own and you need sort of strategic partnerships, strategic alliances between different sectors. And we're still kind of in early days in that mm -hmm. regard. I think there are great examples like the one you mentioned, but we can do actually a lot better in Rip, the Rip, do you have any quick thoughts on the health no, of the I, international I, system? I, I think uh, points Mark's made are exactly spot on. The, uh, the, the fact that the pathway had been demonstrated that it was feasible and we knew how to do the trials and what to look for made the development of this particular vaccine much more compressed in time and was available uh, really within a few years of actually production as opposed to the 10 years of development that it took GSK and, and Merck. Well, I don't know about all of you, but I thought this was going to be a depressing conversation, and I'm actually very buoyed right now so, and hopeful. But let me open up the floor to, to those of you who have comments, questions. Yeah, um, our, our friend, yes? Could the, uh, the gap between three weeks and 10 years be shortened if there was a cap on the professional liability exposure that these pharmaceutical companies have and the, ex the really expensive exposure to insurance claims and medical professional liability if that were capped? Fascinating question. Liability exposure. That uh, I mean, I, both I think Merck and GSK had struggled to find a solution to this in the context of the Ebola response. It's still uh, not solved. It's still not solved. I, I mean, it is, it, it is a gap. I don't think it's driving the time, but it is definitely an issue. Fascinating. Other questions? Yeah. Comments? Cool guys. Well, I want to uh, thank you both. I think, I think just before, since we've got a, a couple of minutes left, I, I, I'd, I'd really like to know from your joint experience, you know, you're, you, I was joking at the beginning about both of you being competitors. I know how well you've collaborated. But in the broader, you know, pharmaceutical side, and I, I just want to be honest that, you know, I was in a, a charity performance in the Hill, um, a Shakespeare thing to raise money for kids, and a lot of senators and congressmen play on this, and I was assigned the role of Big Pharma. That was my title in the thing. And, and it was saying to, you know, to take on a Darth Vader-like voice. Uh, what do you think the public doesn't understand about your industry? Why does it seem, why, why do we joke about that in such a way and, and frame it? And what do you think from, since you're both industry insiders in a way, ought, could be done to actually shift that perception if you think it, if it's something that deserves to be shifted? Well, I, we, we heard it already from uh, the, the uh, fellow from Regeneron, the incredible pride that employees within the company take about the work that we're doing, whether it's, it's to develop a vaccine for malaria. And, and believe me, that has huge, huge internal, um, that resonates with people say, we, we are doing something good for humanity. Hmm. But it, it also extends to, the, to all of the vaccines, the, the 39 vaccines at GSK markets. The, they are all out there to help save lives, to help improve patient outcomes. These, this is why we're there. And I think that story is, while it resonates inside the company, I don't think we tell it very well to the yeah. external community. Mark? Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, not to say that pharmaceutical companies are uniformly good. They have, in certain instances, done things that I think many of them now think mm. are regrettable, but I think a lot of things have changed. But it's the bad stories that get the media attention. The good stories, like the involvement in Ebola, or like you know, progress in treating HIV, would not have happened without pharmaceutical companies. You know, things like the Mectazan donation program that Claire um, you know, referred to earlier. Those are programs that pharmaceutical companies made possible that are really addressing um, you know, the needs of the poorest communities. Mm. There's no commercial return there. And I just think the better people understand those examples and recognize that the people who work for pharmaceutical companies have um, really, a, I think, a genuine commitment to do the right thing. I think we have to find models that make it easy for companies to really maximize the value they have to the public. And I, I think 
you know, it's, a, it's an issue of trust, which is very important, but it's an issue of understanding, and I think that's a role for the media to tell not only the bad stories, but the good stories, and hopefully encourage more good stories to not only come to fruition, but be widely appreciated, because the only people who, um, I mean, I think everyone will benefit if there's a way for the pharma companies to be seen as good public citizens and for them to be the best public citizens they can possibly be. I tried real hard, guys, but they're, they're just too nice. Uh, <laughs> so, so let's give a round of applause from Mark Feinberg, President and CEO of the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, and Rip Ballou, Vice President of GSK Vaccines. Thank you both very much. Thank you.